Last Sunday, the internet connection crashed, and we could only use a mobile hotspot. Only eight people reporting homework. There was no sermon. Actually, Dharma is never far away. It is always presenting itself in our body and mind. If we go listen to Dharma elsewhere, we won't be able to find it. Some people think that Dharma is in the forest, so they go practice there, or they go practice in the cemetery, as they think that Dharma is in there. They don't understand that Dharma is at our body and mind. Some people go meditate in cemeteries, but cemeteries nowadays are unlike ancient cemeteries. Ancient cemeteries are like deserted forest areas. I went once unintentionally. I went to meditate at a temple. And the master told me to stay close to a cemetery's entrance. I was still a layman. I went to meditate, and I was scared. Because I saw ghosts pretty often while meditating, it could be my mind playing tricks. But I was still afraid that ghosts could walk out of the cemetery. At night, I could really hear something walking and gritting its teeth. I was afraid, but finally decided to see for myself what it was. What ghost is gritting its teeth? So I shone the spotlight on the sound, and I saw a dog carrying and gnawing on a bone. I felt ashamed. So I decided to walk into the cemetery. I retreated several times, but finally I made it in. I went in to teach myself that even a dog was not afraid, so I shouldn't be either. After that day, I was no longer afraid. It's only elements and nothing more. During the Buddha's time, a monk went to practice in a cemetery. The cemetery was guarded. But the monk said he would like to meditate on unsightly bodies. The guard told the monk not to walk around. And that they would call the monk when there was a cremation. The tradition was to cremate the body on the day the person died.
One day, a beautiful woman died. And the guard called the monk to see the cremation. When he saw the body, at first he thought that the body was still beautiful. But when the body started burning, it was not pretty anymore. It's like cowhide or animal skin burning. The skin was inflated and broken. There was pus coming out of it. It's disgusting. Finally his mind let go and he became an arahant. We always hear a chat by the monks at funerals. Anija Wata Sankara, Up Patawaya Thamino, Up Pachatawa, Nirachanti, Tezang Wu, Asamo Sukko. This is what he saw and exclaimed as he became an arahant. Fabrications are impermanent. Arising and extinguishing. He saw the arising and extinguishing of Sankara, fabrication. Then he said, the end of fabrication is peaceful. Not, death is peaceful. Sankara is not only the body. It is all fabrications, which is all rupa and nama, physicality and mentality. The body has been turned from beautiful to ugly. and turned into ashes. No more cleanliness, no more dirtiness. One day his body will be the same. He also saw Nama. When he first saw a beautiful body, his mind fabricated that it is beautiful. This is lust arising. When the body is burned it is ugly. This mind doesn't like it. This is anger arising. He finally realized that it's elemental. Nothing beautiful, nothing ugly. It's just concepts. Finally everything became elements. Physical fabrication turns to elements and ends there. But mental fabrication is in his mind. He saw that sometimes it is lust arising. Sometimes anger arising. He saw that all Nama and Rupa are just elements. The body is fire, earth, water, wind, contained in the space element. The mental fabrications arise in unison with the knowing element, Vijnana. He understood that, whether his mind fabricates anger or lust, it was suffering. He saw that all fabrication is suffering, so his mind transcended fabrication. At last he exclaimed, It is peaceful when all sankara, fabrication, is extinguished. Look within your body, not at others' bodies. Learn to see the inner cemetery within ourselves. The inner cemetery is within our body. Each day we put so many animal carcasses in our mouth. See that this body is just a combination of elements, a cycle of elements flowing in and flowing out. 
The mind also has fabrications. Sometimes unwholesome, such as greed, anger, delusion. Sometimes wholesome, not having anger, lust, delusion. And sometimes emptiness, which is another fabrication. He realized that fabrication has no value. Whenever any fabrication arises, it's only suffering arising. As I have always said, whenever fabrication arises, suffering arises. Whenever desire arises, suffering arises. Whenever there is attachment, there is struggling of the mind. There is fabrication, becoming. Those who fabricate wholesomeness suffer as a good person. And those who fabricate unwholesomeness suffer as a bad one, fabricating emptiness that meditators always do. Like what number eight is currently doing. There is also the third type. This is also not correct. What brings us to fabricate? A vijar leads to fabrication. We don't see the truth that our body and mind are just elements. We think this mind is ours. We want it to be good, to be happy, calm, and to reach nirvana. So there is still desire and struggling of the mind. Trying to make it still or empty is just another form of fabrication. As long as there is desire, there is attachment and struggling of the mind. Fabrication, sankara, is still working, and the mind can't transcend suffering yet. Once all fabrication is extinguished, it is true happiness. This fabrication is rupa and nama. The rupa, physicality, consists of elements, and as the body dies, earth, water, wind, fire element returns to its original form. All the elements are contained within the fifth element, space. The nama is also a mental element. As long as this element is still fabricating, it is still suffering. The earth, water, fire, wind elements just return to their form as the body dies. They could only work as they assemble together. Forming a human or animal's body. As the elements break down, they go their own way. No more struggling. The mind is similar. Once it transcends fabrication, it returns to its true form called vijnana element. This vijnana element has no more fabrication, so it's peaceful. As he said, it is peaceful when all fabrications are extinguished. When we intentionally fabricate something a fabrication. Or the mind goes to fabricate anger, lust, delusion a fabrication. Or the mind fabricates wholesomeness such as four Brahma Viharas, mindfulness, wisdom, faith or diligence. All these are fabrications. Concentration is present in each moment. There's either wrong concentration with unwholesome factors and right concentration with wholesome factors. True right concentration is another thing. But it's also a fabrication. As I always teach about having the knower, it's also a fabrication. But it's a necessary fabrication. This ship is like this fabrication. 
It's a ship that we require to cross the sea. Once we get on shore, we need to relinquish the ship, the fabrication. And the mind can reach true happiness. So, it's not that we should go to meditate somewhere. Wherever we are, practice seeing the aggregates working by themselves. All fabrications, whether rupa or nama, arise and extinguish. If we only have interests in merit making, it's not yet true Dharma practice, it's only being good people. No chance for reaching nirvana. Being drunk with merit making. Being drunk with merit making is better than being drunk with demerit. Merit results in happiness, but demerit results in unhappiness. But it's best to practice wisdom development and transcend above merit, demerit. Dharma is not at the master's temples. Or in the forest graveyard. If we go to meditate at the graveyard. And we're afraid of ghosts, it's another fabrication. We could sit all night and fabricate that we are brave. If we are not aware of fabrication wherever we go it is useless. But if we are aware of fabrication, it is always practice. So, Dharma practice is not limited to a place. Whenever we have mindfulness and the upright mind it is wisdom development. Whenever we have mindfulness with a single object, that is calmness meditation. If we have the upright and neutral mind to be aware of rupa and nama, we're doing wisdom development. And we can do it everywhere, even in the bathroom. Some people say, don't practice in the bathroom, but that's not correct. Some people even reach nirvana in the bathroom. My master used to tell me a story about a monk in the apprentice group of Luong Pu Mun. Luong Pu Mun died in the year 1949. This event happened before he died, not too long ago. This monk came to ordain as an elderly monk in the forest tradition. Normally they need to have all three robes with them. Before the sun rises. As they prepare for collecting daily alms. This monk went to a pit toilet. That had two planks of wood which he could squat on. As he was doing his business, one of the robes that he had on his shoulder fell into the pit. He had to lift a plank of wood and get down in the pit to retrieve the robe. As he stepped in, his foot sank in a pool of feces. Traditionally forest monks excrete feces into the pit and urinate into a separate ditch. In the pit there were a lot of flies and crawling worms, he felt really disgusted. Then, he considered that. He tried meditating everywhere already but never in a toilet pit. As Worms was crawling up his leg. He was being mindful of his mind until he understood Dharma. After he attained enlightenment, he climbed up to wash himself and his robes. 
The abbot saw him and scolded him. That it's time for collect arms, not time for washing his robes. The monk replied that he has no more business to do. He was hinting that he has finished his practice, so there's nothing urgent for him anymore. The abbot got angry and thought this old monk was too stubborn. He could not believe that. The monk got enlightenment at the pit toilet. So the monk said let's go to meet Luong Pu Mun. And let Luong Pu Mun be the judge. The two monks set out together after breakfast. It took them three days to meet Luong Pu Mun. As they reached Luong Pu he immediately said. Get right back to your monastery. You have no more business to do. Go quickly. The abbot then understood, but he still had one doubt. Why Luong Pu told him to go back quickly. When they arrived back it had been seven days. The monk died that same day. As he didn't have any other intentions. So, Dharma is everywhere whether we can see it or not. Even in the toilet, Dharma is ever present. In the house, on the street, on public transport, Dharma is ever present. Dharma is everywhere. But if we don't know how to look, even if we go into cemeteries, we won't see it. If we go in there to not be afraid of ghosts, it's not Dharma practice. To practice correctly, see the three characteristics of the aggregates. If we go in there to not be afraid of ghosts, we could be wasting time. Or if we go into forests but not to reduce our defilements, it's also useless. Dharma is not limited to a certain time or place. Even in toilets people have practiced and achieved their goal. Practice to be mindful of our body and mind for the whole day. Except when we need to intentionally think for working. All other time always be mindful of our body and mind. We will be able to see that. The body that is breathing out, breathing in are all impermanent. The body that is standing, sitting, laying down are all impermanent. This body consists of elements. There are elements flowing in and flowing out. Air flowing in and out. Eating and drinking in and urinating, excreting out. It's just a bunch of elements. There's no person, no you, no me. Everything is just rotating elements. We also see our thoughts and all sensation through our senses arising and extinguishing. They are all just elements. The elements that we watch for our practice are not just the four elements. All the six elements. The four elements are earth, water, fire, and air. For the six elements, add space and vijnana. There are also the 18 elements for Dharma practice. Six external elements. Form, sound, smell, taste, touch, thought. Six internal ones, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body, the mind. These are twelve already. And then there's another six of vijnana, the sensation that arises. At the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body, and the mental channel. In total we have eighteen.
with enough practice, we can develop ourselves to see all of these. There seem to be many lessons to learn, but don't worry, just see what you can. Like when are in a bachelor or master's degree program. We also study many things. But the knowledge that we use for working is just a small part of what we have learned. We feel it's a lot of knowledge, but we have been accumulating knowledge since first grade. The same with Dharma practice. Keep learning and accumulating correct knowledge. It's like I have graduated with a bachelor's degree. So I can recall a lot of knowledge. But if you are still in primary school, there's no need to study everything I said. Just study as much as you can. One day you could earn the doctoral degree and accomplish more than me. Nothing is certain. Just practice to be mindful of your body and mind. See the elements working. We can study the five aggregates. The twelve sense bases. The eighteen elements. Or the twenty-two faculties. The twenty-two faculties are mostly nama elements. We don't have to study all of them. There is also the twenty-four pratachasmutpada. All these you will be able to learn by yourself. Just start from being mindful of your body and mind. With the upright and neutral mind. We will be able to see the truth that the body and mind are suffering, non-self, impermanent. Once we see the truth and the mind let go, there's no more fabrication. It will be able to see that the body is suffering. So we don't fabricate how to make it not suffer. When there is nothing more to do, there's no more fabrication. Most of us like to think how to practice correctly or how to improve our practice. These are all fabrications. But when we think about our practice, it's good fabrication. It's good. But it won't get you to nirvana. Because the fabrication is still there. Nirvana is the state that is above all fabrications. But initially we need to fabricate wholesomeness and accumulate the correct understanding. Once our understanding is fully correct, the noble path appears. Once wisdom is ripe, the noble path will appear by itself. No one can make it appear. The noble path will appear by itself once our precepts, concentration and wisdom are ripe. In summary Dharma practice. It's not limited to a place or time. Whenever we are mindful of the current Rupa and Nama. With the upright and neutral mind. Then is wisdom development. Whenever we are mindful of a single object, it is also practice but it is calmness meditation, not vipassana. If we see our stomach bulging and contracting, these are calmness meditations, or see our hand moving, these are calmness meditations. But if we see the moving hand is just a collection of elements, no animal, no person, arising and extinguishing. Then this is vipassana. Seeing the three characteristics is wisdom development. The text says that right concentration is the immediate cause for wisdom to arise. So we need to practice our mind to be upright. With right concentration. And be mindful of our body with the neutral mind. So the mind doesn't sink into the body. Whatever we are mindful of, don't sink into that object. If our mind sinks into the breath,
then the mind is not upright. And we can only get calmness at best. Number 8. You need to adjust a lot. Your mind is stuck in dullness. It's a wrong concentration. Don't be stuck there. It's of no use. Just being dull. Learn about fabrications. The body and mind are fabrications. Learn about them until we can understand the three characteristics and end fabrications. Once we are aware that the body is impermanent, suffering, non-self, we stop wanting the body to be permanent, immortal. We see the body is just a collection of elements. So there's no more fabrication for it to be permanent, everlasting, and under control. Just know the body as it is. Then the mind will let go of the body. And see the mental, nama, working next. Some people can start directly from watching the mental phenomena. See the fabrication in their mind. If we let go of the mind, we will also let go of the body. Because the mind is what we consider as our self and dearest to us. If we can let go of the mind, the body will be let go of automatically. I asked Luong Pu Jun once. I go to several temples and I hear many masters. Always teach about looking at the body. Then I asked, Luong Pu, do I have to watch my body as well? He answered, they watch the body in order to reach the mind. Once you can reach the mind, the body is to be cast away. He replied like this, because in my case, I have reached the mind already and can thus can skip the body. But this is according to each person's proficiency. Some people need to watch their body first. Yesterday there was a group of people that came to study with me. One person in the group kept on thinking. Even as I told him to watch the body. He was thinking whether he could watch the mind. I told him if he is confused and can't see the mind. Then watch the body. If we also cannot watch the body, then do calm meditation. Such is the sequence of practice. However, some people may be able to watch their mind directly. For my case, I watched the body and felt the body was confining. Not an expansive topic. But I felt the mind was complex. Having more than 80 types to study. Having fun to learn. In summary, Dharma is at our body and mind. Be mindful of our body and mind, with the mind that is upright and neutral. If we can watch the mind, do so. If not, watch the body. Otherwise, do calmness meditation. There is always something to do. Watching the mind, watching the body, or calmness meditation. On the days that we're tired, we can do calmness meditation. It's a very good relaxing practice. Each night we sleep for many hours. But if the mind can be in meditative state for an hour, it's even more refreshing. Practice everywhere and all the time.
Be mindful of our body and mind, with the upright and neutral mind. If you can do so, nirvana is not far away. Dharma is not practicing for the mind to be disoriented, dull and rigid. Doing so blocks our chance to see nirvana. That is all for today. Next is the homework review session. Number 1. I do meditation practice at least 15 minutes per day. In the first two years I thought I could see aggregate separate, but lately I don't see any progress. I see that my anger and feeling of self are very strong and while I do meditation my eyebrows are knitted together. I tried moving my awareness elsewhere but still the same thing happened. Please give me some advice. No matter where you move your attention to, it's the same, because the mistake is at your mind. If there's desire, for example, wanting your mind to be good, it is stressful no matter where you move your mind. Be aware of your own mind. If it wants to be good, wants to see or wants to be something. Whatever your mind wants, just be aware of it. It is a simple and ordinary practice. If your eyebrows are tense, but you move your mind elsewhere, it's still the same because its cause is still there. Its root cause is desire. Be aware of your desire. Learn of the result and relinquish the cause. This is a critical principle for our practice. Learn the result and relinquish the cause. What are the results? The five aggregates and suffering are the result. Its cause is defilement. When there's defilement, there's action which is fabrication of the mind. Then the result is suffering. So, the Buddha said that suffering is to be made aware of, not to be relinquished. The cause of suffering is to be relinquished. Ignorance, desire, attachment, these are cause of suffering. So, if you feel your eyebrows are tense, don't think about where to put your mind. But be aware that your mind is tense. It is tense because it wants to be good. When you're aware of this root cause, the tension will be gone. And the tightness in your eyebrows will be gone. This is the same with the Four Noble Truths. Dukkha is to be made aware of and Samud Daya is to be relinquished. Number 2 I practice walking meditation for one hour a day. When my mind is restless, I stay with Luang Pu Kao's prayer. Buddha Met Tang Chitang Mama. Buddha Buddha Nupawena. In my daily life I have some mindfulness. But it seems not frequent like previously. May I get your advice? After meditating for some time, the practice can get stagnant, so you need to encourage yourself. Meeting a master can make you active. And if you need to submit homework, even more so. Once you got today's slot, did you feel you need more practice? It was the same with me previously. After a period of meditating at home I went to meet my masters. And I couldn't be sluggish. Our masters are old, but they use a lot of their energy to teach us. If we just listen but don't practice, we should feel ashamed to meet them. Sometimes we need to encourage ourselves, 
There are several techniques. Sometimes we need to encourage or comfort ourselves. If we feel we're not progressing, we can say to ourselves that previously it was worse. This is just temporary and it will improve. Sometimes we need to threaten it. If our mind is too lazy, we can warn it that people are dying every day. We never know when it will be our time to go. We tell it to not be in a place where at death. We regret not having practiced enough. So, in our practice, sometimes we need to encourage, comfort, or teach our mind. We can teach it by setting a question for the mind to contemplate. For example, what is causing the mind to struggle? The mind can then consider what is the cause of so much struggling. Slowly set questions for it to answer. But be cautious, as this can lead to too much restlessness. Sometimes we need to go meet our masters or friends that practice like us. When I was starting, I had a buddy that went to meet masters together with me, whether up the mountains or in forests. Every day that we meet, we would constantly talk about our practice and encourage each other. Sometimes my practice could be sluggish, but if I saw that he was active I couldn't remain sluggish. And vice versa. We encourage each other. If we can find a practicing friend in the same house, especially your husband or wife, it would be best having a close friend to meditate together. And encourage each other is one way to keep our practice active. Your practice is okay. Don't be sluggish with your practice. Keep teaching your mind that people are dying from COVID-19 every day. Number 3. In the morning I meditate chanting Buddha. In the evening I do walking meditation. And during daytime I see whatever is suitable. Quite often when I'm not doing anything, I still feel tight to the point of feeling tired. While I'm taking a shower, I see my mind wander to think frequently. May I ask for your advice? While taking a shower, you feel it's not time to practice. So there's no intention. And it's good. You have the same problem as the first person. Which is setting too much intention. And forcing yourself. Once there's forcing, there's the result which is tightness. We don't solve the tightness directly. Suffering is to be known. But we relinquish at its cause which is desire. If you try to meditate it will be tight. But while taking a shower you're not thinking about meditation. And it's just right. So, the problem is with your desire to progress in meditation. Just be aware of this and you'll be fine. I'm applauding you. For your strong perseverance and dedication to meditation. Currently your practice is okay. But if you're aware that you want to be good and forcing yourself. Then your practice will be even better. Number 4. I practice every night by chanting and having the mind watch my breath. If my mind drifts elsewhere, I see that it can think by itself it's not myself.
During daytime I have the mind to see my body working. If it goes away thinking I realize so. I would like to know if I'm practicing correctly. It's correct. But did you wake up earlier than usual? Are you still sleepy? Your mind doesn't have energy. If your mind is like this, just do calm meditation. Don't think about wisdom or the separation of aggregates. Just chant Budo or watch your breath. But don't start by adjusting your mind. Just breathe and watch with a normal mind. And it'll be calm. If you adjust your mind it may become dull. Your practice is okay. But now you don't have enough concentration. Your mind is dull and sleepy. Can you feel that after you watch your breath? Your mind has more energy. But still doesn't return to its base. If you notice so it's not a problem. The mind will come back by itself. What you're practicing is good. Number 5 I just survived from COVID-19. I see the mind that is aware or that drifts away are both uncontrollable. Is my practice still correct? It's correct. When we see life as uncertain, we'll have no other refuge. When we're seriously sick, not sure if we're going to survive or not, Dharma will be our only refuge. So, stay with your practice. And your mind will have more energy. Sometimes the body can heal faster. Take the lesson learned from surviving COVID-19 to teach yourself. Not to be lazy with your practice. When you're healthy you need to practice. Sometimes you need to warn your mind. Sometimes you need to threaten it. There might be another plague coming. Life is uncertain. Keep teaching your mind to be energetic with practice. Number 6. I practice by sitting or laying meditation. Being aware, watching my breath. When my mind is restless I'll chant or listen to your teaching. I try to be mindful in my daily life. And I can see anger most easily. But while I'm practicing formally. I feel as if there is wind flowing in my forehead. Sometimes so strong that I feel tight there. It has happened for seven months already. I feel I'm not progressing. I still have strong attachment and fear of suffering. Please give me some advice. What you have said is all good. Sometimes while we practice, we can see the wind element working. See, is it at this point? Sometimes you can feel like a fan spinning in there. It's a chakra point. Where energy can flow in and out. Some people can practice to gain some special abilities. But it is as it is. No need to pay attention to it or correct it. Just see the wind rotating at your forehead. If your mind feels concerned or doesn't like it. Because it is not calm, just know so. The rotation is a bodily feeling. Let it be and just be aware of your mind. When the mind has concentration, 
Some people can sense this rotation at their hands or feet or elsewhere. But it's not important. Number four, your mind drifts off. Number seven. At the beginning of the year, I have practiced walking meditation continuously. Initially I practiced by chanting Bhutto and watching my walking body. From beginning of this year I practice by watching my body only. I feel I have more mindfulness. But my mind is still restless. Please advise how I should improve. You know what is good by yourself. But if your mind is restless, don't stop chanting Budo. Restlessness is the mind going away thinking. Without our intention. We chant Budo to set a topic for the mind to think. So when it goes away, we can sense it quickly. If your mind is restless, don't leave Budo. When your mind moves away you can be aware quickly. What you're practicing is good. Just a bit too much restlessness. Don't throw away Budo. Number 6. When practicing. Don't let your mind sink in like that. Number three, you're still focusing too much. Just sense it. Number eight, I've checked homework for you several times already. Do you realize where's your mistake yet? Dharma practice is not about forcing your body and mind. That is erring on the side of control. But forgetting your body and mind is erring on the side of sensual indulgence. When we forget our body and mind, it goes to the form, smell, taste, sound, touch or thought. This is being too lenient. So Dharma practice is walking the middle path. Not too strict which is being forceful, stressful. And also not too lenient which is lacking mindfulness. Being lost in thoughts. So we select a suitable meditation. And notice our mind. Staying with the breath or whatever else. When the mind strays, just be aware of it. When it leaves the breath or budo to think. And then come back to be with your breath or budo again. If your mind doesn't have concentration, it can't develop wisdom. Only restlessness and defilement arises. Some people don't practice concentration. They just think about how the body and mind are suffering, non-self and impermanent, without proper concentration. This is all just restlessness. When they continue thinking, their mind may seem to be calm. The mind is outside and doesn't reach its base. It is wrong concentration. Firstly we have to practice correct concentration. For the mind to be aware and knowing. And use this upright mind for wisdom development. Wisdom development is having mindfulness to see the truth of the body. And mind with the upright and neutral mind. The upright and neutral mind is very important. We're not to create a dull or motionless mind. That is tightness and control. The mind is bright and delightful by itself. If we make it dull, that's seriously incorrect. Just wasting time. 
and causing pointless difficulty. Listen to the recording of my teaching and take my lesson today to improve yourself. Your mind now is much better than before, do you realize so? Previously it was like a drunk mind. The mind needs to be fresh and awake to be right. Now your mind is not so good again. Because it strayed away thinking. When you intentionally practice it's too tight. When you forget your practice it's too lenient. Take notice when it's either too tight or too lenient. It's too tight when you have greed. And want your practice to be good. And too lenient when the mind is lost in the senses. We can't create the middle path. We need to be aware of the two incorrect sides. And the mind automatically enters the middle path. What is correct can't be made up. Just be aware of what is incorrect, and the mind automatically becomes correct. That is all for today.